as uh, we start to hand it over to Chris. But as I mentioned, uh, this is an Ohio X Tech Talk. What we hope to get out of it is the ability to learn, to share, to grow networks. And as part of Chris's talk uh, on network visibility, hopefully people can learn a little bit and uh, learn more about what him and Bob and the rest of the team at Arista are up to. But Chris, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, I'll, I will let you quarterback it from here on out. So thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. And thanks for the invite um, to be part of your community. It's, uh, it's wonderful seeing what Ohio X has been up to and uh, connecting all of us and the disparate technologies that we all work with. So from an Arista standpoint, uh, I'm the uh, SE manager of this region, uh, cover a couple states uh, here, including Ohio, and I'm from Columbus. Uh, I live just on the east side of, of Columbus and have been here pretty much all my life with a brief stint in the, in the Navy. I've uh, been with Arista for almost six years now, and it's been a crazy journey. Uh, gosh, there's so much going on in technology, data center networking, WAN, backbone networking, the 5G rollouts. Uh, so I just, today I thought I'd share some stories about uh, what are these data centers? What's this big data? What's all the speeds uh, that everybody's talking about uh, that rolled out in 2020? What can we expect in 2021 through 2023? And then with all this data flying around, how do we view it? How do we manage that data? Uh, so here at the end, I wanna talk about some of the visibility that we need to troubleshoot problems or to help us with things like security breaches. You know, Of course, the biggest news here over the last couple of weeks has been with solar winds or the breach that was uh, made possible through an exploit in solar winds, which is a tool that almost all of us use. <laughs> Uh, so thousands of companies have been impacted by that. And what, what could we do to, to hunt and, and look for those kind of uh, malicious behaviors? So I thought I'd talk about data center networks, um, routers, switches, interfaces, and then that visibility uh, with all this data flying around. Uh, how do we see what's, what's on the wire or, or in the air? Um, so what is the data? Uh, I, I really like uh, what Domo puts out every year. They have a nice graph that comes out annually showing us what's happening on the internet every minute of every day. Uh, and that comes out annually. We could see 2017, uh, some of the, the statistics that they had for us, how much YouTube watching was going on, tweets, Netflix, emails. And then moving over to 2019, what do some of those numbers look like? And of course, you know, just this past year in 2020, uh, what do those numbers look like? Uh, how much traffic is out there? And, and the way we know this is through the visibility that we'll talk about. How do, um, how do we actually see this traffic flying around our backbones? And of course, I had a you know, highlight Zoom now made the list. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing to believe that there's over 200,000 participants in a Zoom meeting of every minute of every day, but I guess uh, we're doing that right now. So we're, we're contributing to those 2021 numbers. Uh, what happens every minute at every day. So you know, thinking about like end users, uh, we've heard a lot about 5G and the 5G rollouts that service providers are going through right now. And you know, just a generic view of what a 5G network might look like and focusing in on, hey, what happens when we increase the bandwidth out on the edge of these networks? So whether you're a home user uh, on your cell phone, uh, surfing the web, connecting to your corporate environment. The more bandwidth that we increase there on the edge, what we have to watch out for is how much bandwidth now do we need in our backbones, right? Um, all this traffic has to get to those destinations. Traffic is rarely user to user. Usually you're consuming something from a public cloud or maybe your corporate private cloud. And that gets to the core of these networks, the backbones of these networks. And what we have to watch out for is trying to pour a gallon of milk into a thimble, right? It doesn't matter how fast we pour, it's not gonna fit. So we've gotta be careful about those oversubscription ratios that we have in the backbones of our networks. And that's where our routers come in, our switches and these interface speeds, things like 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig, and we'll talk about 400 gig and even 800 gig speed interfaces uh, that'll be coming out here in a few years. So if you're not familiar with networking, if you don't touch routers and switches every day, I just wanted to kind of show some pictures of the gear. You may be familiar with Netgear or Linksys for your home network. 
Um, showing an example of these are switches that would be typically in a corporate environment. So for those times that we are in corporate offices, you know, if you happen to walk down a hall and you, you pass a closed door and you hear a lot of fan noise, maybe there's a little heat coming from that room. Uh, these are the types of networking devices that are in those closets providing computer connectivity, um, your, uh, as well as your phones and, and your iPads and your corporate offices to their wireless networks. And then moving into the data center, how big these devices can possibly get. So these are some examples from Arista, some data center switches. You can see there's just hundreds and sometimes even thousands of interfaces that we need in order to connect your servers, your computers uh, to one another and to subsequently to other networks. And I'll just show you an example uh, here from Facebook posted a couple years ago with some uh, Arista switches there in the background. Uh, showing all the, the fiber connectivity that's necessary to get that server-to-server -server communication to work. And as we connect more and more of these devices together, these backbones, these cores, these data centers, they get massively large, just huge data centers. And just to show you, you know, an abstract view of what some of that connectivity looks like, where every node here, every square, uh, on this drawing is a network device. It's a router or it's a switch in somebody's data center. And here's another example. Um, we often see this kind of scale with a Facebook or Microsoft Azure, where it just takes an immense amount of networking equipment to provide all that end-to-end -end connectivity to those servers. And if we open up the switch, Let's take the cover off and look inside and see the anatomy of a switch or a router. You'll hear those terms used interchangeably. Um, we used to need to have dedicated equipment for a specific role uh, where I needed a router to do certain things, or you may hear a switch had certain responsibilities in a network. The switches today are so stout with the resources that they have inside of them that more or less we're doing away with routers and we're just putting that functionality in the switches themselves. But in this diagram, you can see in the center, it's, this is a diagram from Broadcom that uh, one of the manufacturers that makes ASICs or application specific integrated circuits where, where the ASIC inside of a switch, that's, that's the money maker. Um, yes, there's CPUs inside of here, but a, a CPU inside of a network e piece of equipment is really relegated to the, the health and care of the device rather than the real moving of the packets in and out of these devices. Uh, that's what the ASIC is for. So the ASIC um, takes traffic in across an interface, does a lookup on that traffic, tries to determine where that traffic needs to go, and then subsequently sends it out, you know, an egress interface along the next hop to its destination. And here's just another example, a, a down view. Uh, we can see looking from above uh, a switch where on the right, we would have all the interfaces, all of our optical transceivers connecting in. And then we have this massive ASIC here uh, in the switch with a huge heat sink on it. Then we see our, our power supplies and, and our fans for the cooling that we need. Uh, these devices do get quite hot and that's why you hear quite a bit of noise from those telecom closets or, or from those data centers. And you'll notice we have these transceivers outside of the switch or the router. And the transceivers are there to facilitate the ability to, to accommodate different speeds. So something may connect at one gig, it may connect at 10 gig or 25 gig, or the switch to switch connectivity would be maybe 100 gig or in the future 400 gig. So with these transceivers, I could have port one of this device running at one gig speed and then port two just adjacent to that running at perhaps 10 gig or 25 gig. So if we take an example, you know, what's your home PC doing? Typically that's a, that's a one gig connection, whether you're on wired or some of the throughput you're getting through your wireless network. Whereas a server inside of a data center is gonna typically connect at 10 gig or 25 gig. And if we think about the five gig that's rolling out, you know, what kind of speeds can we expect out there? And it's all relative to your um, distance to the network resources, any interference that's in the air. But roughly speaking, you're gonna get somewhere between one and 10 gig uh, once all those five gig features roll out for us. And then when we talk about switch to switch or network device to network device, we have to think about, okay, we've got all these things at one gig and 10 gig and 25 gig. As that all adds up, we've got to watch that oversubscription ratio 
between switch to switch or router to router, one network device to another. And typically what we shoot for is a five to one over subscription ratio or perhaps a three to one over subscription ratio where we need to make sure the infrastructure can absorb all that traffic and get it to its final destination. So over the past couple of years, we've been building that type of connectivity from network device to network device at 100 gig. It's the most common speed used today between devices. What we have coming out this year, or what you'll see out in the wild this year is 400 gig. Um, each one of the OEMs, the switch manufacturers, Arista included, we offer switches that'll have um, 400 gig interfaces here on the device where the whole device may be 400 gig interfaces. Like as an example, perhaps 32 ports of 400 gig or it may have several 100 gig interfaces and then the link between the devices would be uh, connected at 400 gig. But we're not gonna stop there. The 400 gig optics are rolling out now and the highest speed that we've ratified is 800 gig. Uh, so the standards bodies, the OEMs get together and independent standards bodies get together and they ratify um, the protocols that we need, the communication that we need to ensure interoperability between vendors and they recently ratified 800 gig. So pretty soon uh, we'll see 800 gig rolling out into our infrastructures as well. So if we think about it, just kind of group it together. Hey, our edge connections, we're working for, with anything from typically one gig up through about 25 gig. And then in the core or the backbone of our networks in those data centers, that's where you'll see our, our 100 gig to 400 gig and the 800 gig. Uh, speeds and you can see the, the relative relationship here between those speeds. It's it's kind of mind blowing uh, how fast the core of the network needs to run in order to facilitate all those end hosts. So what's on the wire? Like how do we see these things communicate with each other? Uh, you'll hear terms like packet analyzer or sniffing or packet sniffing. Uh, packet captures. A common tool that we use as network engineers is is Wireshark. So here's an example of where uh, I took a packet capture of two devices talking to each other across a networking wire. And this is what that, that protocol communication looks like. So this is where we can dig in and start to see how are two devices talking to one another? Are they talking to each other correctly? Or do we have some sort of incompatibility that may be causing a problem uh, that we're troubleshooting for you as an end user? And what happens typically is, you know, that's great for me to, to look at one connection at any point in time, but I really need to see all the connections all the time because I'm not sure when or where, you know, I could possibly have a problem, whether that's just operationally and I'm troubleshooting an issue, or if a security team would approach me and say, hey, we think there's been some malicious behavior and we'd like to see what that communication was on the network. I really need to capture all the traffic all the time from every single point in my production network. And once you realize that you have that need, customers typically need some sort of solution to be able to help build that packet capture capability. You'll hear terms like a tap aggregation or maybe a network packet broker. But what we're describing here is, hey, I need to put a device in my data center for which I can copy all the production traffic that's going back and forth in the data center. I want, I want to copy that. I, I, essentially, I want a Xerox copy of what's going on. I don't want to interrupt the production flow, but I need to see that and I want to be able to analyze it and store it for reference for later. And so we'll put in these network packet devices uh, and traffic steering devices so that we can get that traffic, that copy of traffic to our tools. And it's not uncommon for as the network, the production network grows, so too will grow the network um, packet broker part of our network where, hey, we've got more traffic, you know, 400 gig, 800 gig, more servers, you know, 5,000, 10,000 inter interfaces inside of a data center. And so my network packet broker network has to also scale with that. And then we inevitably end up with more and more tools to send to and we need more tools, right? I need um, application visibility tools for the application team to know how their services are performing or the security team to be able to look for things like data loss prevention or visibility into things like this SolarWinds based exploit um, that rolled out into the wild that we discovered just a, a few weeks ago. 
So how a lot of customers will start off is they will put in one device, one networking device that's there solely for the intent of copying the traffic to our tools. So over on the left, you know, an abstract view of our production network where we're routing and switching your packets to where they need to go and then copying that traffic over and using nodes or tools to analyze that traffic. How is it performing uh, and store it for playback later. Uh, and then as the networks grow, so too grows that packet collection network infrastructure. So we go from maybe just one switch or one device to multiple devices and a whole slew of tools that we need to connect in there to monitor our network performance. How's our voice traffic doing? How's the video traffic? You know, is there any jitter? Is there any loss on the video network? We need tools to analyze that for us because frankly, you know, one-to-one -one as a network engineer, uh, there's entirely too much data and there's too many points in the network for me to do that manually. I need to bring in tools to, to help analyze that traffic. So as an example, I've mentioned SolarWinds. If you think about, hey, I've got SolarWinds installed in my infrastructure. It's been exploited, right? We're stealing data out through um, an attack vector of SolarWinds. What I need to do is be able to copy that stolen data and that communication that's happening and get that data over to my security tools. So that the security team can look for those anomalies and, and detect that something uh, nefarious is going on inside of our networks. So that's where we get, you know, why do we need to see all this traffic? The use cases are the security exploits as well as me operationally keeping an eye on what's going on. And, and being able to do things like send that traffic to a recorder node is an example. So what we mean by recorder node is um, as everything flies by, we're going to copy that and we're going to keep it. So we're not just going to look at it for one second. I want to be able to refer back to that a day later or two or three days later. You know, as a network engineer, it's not uncommon for me to be in situations where I might get into the office Monday morning and somebody will come over and say, hey, we noticed we had a problem Friday night and Saturday morning with XYZ application. Well, I need to be able to go back and look at what was going on, not just with the network eating equipment, but the actual traffic that was flowing through the network at that time so that I could try to isolate and work with my peers in the application group or in the compute side or the storage group and, and try to figure out uh, what had happened, even though it's in the past. So sometimes you'll hear us make references to these types of solutions being like a DVR for your network, the ability to go and play back what occurred uh, even days or weeks ago, if we could store all that data. So, you know, finally, just kind of wrapping up, I need this visibility. There's a ton of traffic going around our networks. It's a big data lake. Uh, and I, I just cannot manually do this. Uh, I, can't, I can't do this just a spot in time. So that's where Arista, in, in addition to providing you route switch capability and moving those packets, we also want to help you analyze that traffic. Uh, so Arista purchased a, a security company called Awake where we can deploy sensors that are able to analyze all this traffic and then use some intelligence to look for those anomalies. You know, baseline the network and look for these little blips that unexpectedly show up, you know, hey, this device, for instance, our solar winds installation, it's, it's never talked to this internet connection over in, you know, overseas. Uh, what's going on there? Why, why is that happening? And that's something that as a human, you would never be able to find on your own. And you need to bring these tools to bear uh, to help you analyze that stuff. So capture, you know, one, stitching the network together, getting all the production data flowing, and then two, building an infrastructure that can copy and then subsequently analyze that data for us uh, to help us with our, our security vulnerabilities and just the operational overall operational health of the network. And then before I wrapped up, Chris, I wanted to make sure I shared some contact information if anybody wants to reach out to myself or Bob here uh, locally in the region um, through Arista. Uh, as well as I wanted to mention you know, our Ohio networking user group. Uh, this is something that uh, Jason Ginterd and Bob and a couple others uh, about four years ago this February, uh, we founded a um, vendor agnostic, completely sales neutral uh, environment where network engineers can get together and share information. So it's a chance for me to take off my Arista hat and just talk 
as a network engineer about the technologies that we're working with today and what we see coming down the pipe, what, what we need to, to get familiar with and, and hone expertise on uh, as technology continues to change for us. So uh, uh, the, the ONUG meets quarterly. I mean, when we were in person, we'd meet at a brewery or a distillery every quarter and we'd rotate that from Cleveland to Columbus to Cincinnati. Uh, January in 2020, we were able to sneak in a visit to uh, Toledo, where we hosted the event in Toledo. And we'll have anywhere from 50 to 100 people uh, attend these events where we can share stories, much like this, uh, do some tech talks and, and share information about what's going on in, in the networking industry. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and for sharing all this. And I'll, I'll start it with a question. Um, and before I do, um, if anyone else wants to, you know, think of questions and you can unmute yourselves after I've finished or put it in the chat. Um, this is really an opportunity to just have a conversation and nothing formal. Um, and then what I'll maybe also ask also do is maybe Chris or Jason, if you're interested um, to talk a little bit more about the Ohio networking user group of just maybe the kind of how it came to be. And if Jason, you want to add anything uh, specific to that, but to start um, Chris, this is something that I like to ask as we have these types of events across a whole range of, of, of uh, areas. And so this is obviously, you know, very different than as we talk about sales or talk about like marketing within tech. Um, but this is a common question that I think is just kind of uh, an interesting one of if, if you had to have people walk away from today with two things in mind. Um, and I like to say two because it's tough to pick one and sometimes three can get to a lot. But if there's two things from your talk today, what would you like people to walk away with? Oh, um, let's see. One, I, you know, I try to keep it at a high level for anybody that's not deep into networking day in and day out uh, like I am. It's just understanding um, how traffic gets from point A to point B, you know, just the kind of infrastructure it flows through. Uh, the, the devices are involved in, in the labor that goes into building those infrastructures and then subsequently managing them, like managing the, the data centers. Like here we have in, in Ohio and in, in Columbus, you know, we've got Google here now, Facebook's here, AWS has got data centers here, um, managing these networks and, and helping get traffic from point A to point B, especially in 2020 when so many people had to change the nature they worked and where they worked that natively caused our traffic to flow different ways than it had before. So just kind of understanding the end-to-end -end flow. And then secondly, I'd say visibility, um, that we have to be mindful and watch this. It's important to, to invest the money into those resources, into the skill sets that can analyze that traffic and secure us, right? I know I, I'm a network person. Uh, to me, it's free love. I want everybody to be able to get anywhere. I'm not really security minded all the time, but you know, the solar winds exploit here recently is just a vivid reminder that we've got to protect ourselves from those malicious actors that are out there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. And Jason, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to the, what Chris mentioned about uh, the networking user group that you all started, but uh, if you'd like to, please feel free. Sure, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, so, um, you know, I got together with, with Chris and actually you know, Bob and, you know, uh, actually, and Mitch, a few other people, and we were talking about, um, you know, user group meetings. So, the, uh, you know, there's other segments of IT like, um, you know, VMware user group and Linux user group and Windows user group. There's all these different user groups. So we noticed there wasn't really something for uh, generally for, net, uh, for network engineers. So we thought to ourselves, well, why don't we start one ourselves? And the first meeting was in Cleveland. I think we had 15 people at the Oak Barrel down in, uh, in Valley View. And uh, it's grown to the point where I think our last physical event in uh, Cleveland, we had a, about 150 folks show up to that event. Um, so, um, you know, it's grown quite a bit and Bob was kind enough to put a, a link in the, in the, uh, chat. If anybody wants to join, uh, we're on meetup. That's how we usually do most of the coordination and keep track of the members. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's organically grown pretty quickly. Um, we've, at, you know, started out in just Cleveland, then we were doing Cleveland and Columbus for a little while. And then we added Cincinnati and then Toledo just came on, um, uh, actually, our first meeting was in uh, just a year ago, 
um, in Toledo. Um, we're really hoping to get back to physical meetups again soon, but in the meantime, we have been doing some virtual ones. So we've had uh, two virtual events because like uh, Chris said, we were doing uh, quarterly events uh, in person and we're doing monthly uh, happy hours every, every second Thursday of the month. So um, if you sign up for the, the meetup group, you'll get communication on uh, when those are coming and the Zoom info to, to join those for anyone to, who's interested. So um, so our next one is, I think, uh, a week from tomorrow, actually, we will be the, the next virtual uh, happy hour. And those are, uh, there's no real format to those. We just come, you know, we come to those with um, some general topics to, to discuss openly uh, and just kind of a, uh, uh, pretty casual forum. Typically, people have a beer, or, you know, while they're on the Zoom, and it's it's you know pretty open, pretty casual. Uh, so the other events, the quarterly events that we're doing virtually now, there's there's typically a topic. You know, we'll do a presentation, and we'll we'll do uh, maybe a panel discussion uh, about the networking industry. But uh, I think it's a great resource for those who are interested to take advantage of if you're interested in networking and you want to find out what's happening in the um, the, the world of a network engineer, if you're a network engineer yourself or you're interested, um, uh, it's, it's a great resource for those involved. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jason. And uh, uh, another thing that I kind of wanted to piggyback on real quickly that Chris, you had mentioned was uh, you mentioned the data centers and, and I'm in Columbus and I know you are in the area, Columbus, uh, Central Ohio as well as, uh, especially in the New Albany area, uh, that there are three uh, Google uh, Facebook and Amazon, I believe, have built massive data center oper operations. And JR from Facebook, I saw you were able to join. So thanks for, for joining. I don't know if you want to hop in at any point, but uh, maybe JR, if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing folks that are from, you know, we have people from Michigan, from Southern Ohio, from Northern Ohio, uh, just what, what's going on with the Facebook data center specifically. Uh, we can't quite hear you. I don't know if you're unmuted or if it's a mic issue. Still nothing, sorry. That's okay. Um, well, if there's any other questions, happy to open it up now. Um, if there's any other thoughts or whatnot, I know we had a few other people that have trickled in. So like Naveed and Lori, I, I see you. Thanks for joining. But um, happy to happy to open it up to any other questions or comments that folks may have. I see, Jason, I see you unmuted. Did you have something or Jay, are you unmuted again? If maybe you had something. Nothing on my side. I was just, uh, I muted myself while I was coughing. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, talking about New Albany, New Albany is super interesting because the, the village of New Albany seemed to have this concept. If you build it, they will come. Uh, you know, years and years ago, they started building out in, that infrastructure. Um, you needed power, you needed optic, right? Power and fiber. Uh, and so partnering with AEP and getting all the necessary power out there, and then also with AEP and some other local carriers getting uh, all the fiber laid and ready um, for, for those big data centers to come along. So that's been, that's been great to see. It's, it's really neat driving out there. You know, so many of the buildings are unlabeled, <laughs> uh, but you certainly see those, the, the big generators outside and you've got an idea of uh, that's probably a, a data center. Uh, when you drive by any building I drive by, I always look for, hey, does, does it have a generator? Because if it does, it's likely got a data center in it as well. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. One of the, the last kind of bigger events that I had gone to before uh, everything really shut down in March was the Facebook uh, data center grand opening over in New Albany. And um, it was one fascinating because I'd been in some data centers, but the size and scale and just how impressive the Facebook one is in particular, um, it's just, it's, it's really incredible. Um, and I remember asking kind of to your point about, uh, you know, the location and, you know, it's r rather interesting that there are uh, so many of them in one geographic spot. And you had mentioned AEP. So the electricity, I believe is such an important, um, you know, the, the physical location of the new Albany 
uh, land is just, you know, real close to the electricity grid, I guess. Um, but also uh, someone had mentioned, and I, I assume it's true, it sounds true, that uh, central Ohio from a uh, kind of a weather uh, standpoint is a rather safe place compared, you know, we don't have hurricanes, some things like, uh, you know, not really a crazy tornado alley, we don't, our, our weathers are somewhat mild compared to other parts of the country. So it was just really interesting how, you know, three big tech companies decided uh, that this was a, a great place to do it. And it's just a fascinating thing to see Ohio have this Silicon Valley connection. And I know, you know, Arista is also a California company that employs Ohioans. So it's, it's cool to see that pipeline between the West Coast and Ohio happening. Yeah, the placement of data centers is so interesting because you, know, you have the real estate to be dealt with. And then, of course, you know, the gov local governments get involved in tax abatements and things like that. But it's also, to your point about the weather, um, we typically joke about a 100-year study where a lot of times we'll take a location, you know, GPS set of coordinates and say, okay, what's happened here over the last hundred years? Do I have to worry about a flood? Do I have to worry about tornadoes? Uh, so a lot of my customers that I work with is they're building their secondary or tertiary data centers. Uh, that's some of the work that they go into as part of their business due diligence is to look for, hey, what kind of diversity do I, you know, am I on a separate power grid? Um, is there any common, even down to the manhole, is there a common conduit that I have fiber in that goes to both my data centers. Because if that yellow fiber finder, that backhoe hits that conduit, you know, could I actually have a double data center outage? So yeah, it's uh, quite a bit, it's a bit of a science um, to pick those locations before you pour that concrete. Yeah, I'd be curious. I don't know if Chris or others on, on the call know, and I know Brian, you're with, with H5 up in the Cleveland area, um, but just what curious of how many are there does if anyone might know across the state obviously there's you know big ones like the Facebooks of the world and then uh, you know smaller private companies like the Expedience or H5 of the world but um, it, I don't know if anyone happens to know what that you know what that number looks like or how, how prevalent that they are in our state compared to perhaps other places. Yeah Jason you work with quite a few right I mean we've got what in Volta and Equinex and uh, what is it uh, who else do we have here in Ohio? Quite a few up in the Northeast, right? Yeah. Um, well, Expedient and Volta has definitely got, got a couple here. H5, of course, Brian um, with H5 downtown, lovely facility, you know, toured it a couple times. There, there are a number of them and there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, selecting where to place a data center. You know, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating, you know, not only, um, you know, the, like you mentioned, Chris, the, um, you know, the, the risk of natural disasters, but also power costs, connectivity. And, you know, this region's actually kind of uh, landlocked from a, an access perspective. The really the only routes out of here from as far as fiber is back to Ashburn, Virginia or Chicago. So, this, the, you know, the, that's why it was, you know, ideal to build another data center here to service like this region because it, of that, you know, the, the, the Appalachian Mountains really kind of prevent uh, you know, that fiber access without them, them cutting through the mountains. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's actually a perfect place, a perfect spot that's, in, you know, right in between New York and Chicago uh, to service the, you know, this entire region. And, and it's become known as, you know, U.S. East 2 on all of those, U.S. East 1 being, uh, you know, Ashburn, Virginia, that's kind of the, the U.S. East primary but now uh, Columbus being U.S. East too, it's kind of the, you know, this, this new point of gravity for everyone's data in this region. Um, it's pretty cool to see that that, uh, that that has emerged right here in Ohio. Hmm. That is interesting. And, and I know, you know, we're talking about data, and, and, but uh, a statistic that Jobs Ohio, the state's kind of quasi-public-private economic development group uh, that as we talk about customers and just our ge the geographic location of Ohio, whether it's, you know, East Coast, New York, other places go to uh, a bit further West in Chicago. I think it's like 60% of the American economy is within like a day's drive. Um, and so as, you know, we think about Ohio and the competitiveness of our state and the geographic location that we find ourselves, uh, it's interesting that, you know, whether it's physical goods or in this case, you know, di digital uh, is, is the case that, that it's, it's, it's interesting. Hey, hey, it is. This is uh, Brian over at H5. Thanks. Yeah. And 
Chris and Jason for um, highlighting us briefly. Uh, you guys have all mentioned very good points and it's all selling points that, you know, not just H5, but other data centers in Northeast Ohio capitalize on is you did mention the fact that uh, Cleveland is actually a keynote along very fiber routes from New York City to Chicago. Um, so there's a lot of good low latency routes that uh, enterprises do look to take advantage of. I know that we've tried to pursue, um, and in some cases successfully, East Coast companies. Uh, power rates are outrageous out on the East Coast. Um, there's just, uh, it, there's a lot of incentive for customers to look at cheaper power. We do have some state tail, uh, sales tax incentives that aren't um, available out in New York, um, Philadelphia, uh, up, you know, up in the Boston area that we can extend here in Ohio. So from a competitive standpoint between power, uh, tax incentives, the ability to still have low latency connectivity routes, uh, data centers are very, very prominently being featured now um, on the East Coast. And just throughout the summer as COVID was going on and people were looking at, you know, secondary tertiary data centers, uh, we saw a lot of, I saw a lot of my colleagues out West um, in California, in Phoenix, really featuring Cleveland as a great DR business continuity site. Um, so yeah, it's just, it, it, we are a really great market. And um, it, from, from H5 perspective, we do have 13 data centers uh, in the US and it, Cleveland is kind of our crown jewel, just in the fact that um, the interest that it's drawn, not just locally here, but across the country. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Yeah, and it's so nice to have so many of them in our backyard, right? I mean, if you're an enterprise and you've decided you're getting out of the data center business, let's just say, hey, we don't want to have an on-prem data center anymore. We don't want the facilities headache and the management and the overhead of that. Moving, you know, all of your equipment into someone else's facility, if it's going to be a physical equipment type thing, not just a virtual services like a public cloud. But it's so nice that they're within such a close drive, right? So inevitably, I, I'm going to need hands and eyes inside of those facilities. I'm going to need bodies to go in and rack mount servers or to run cabling and install infrastructure. And I, I know a lot of uh, enterprise customers, as they step towards public cloud, you know, that interim step of still having a physical place that I can visit, whether that's just a rack in that location or a whole cage, uh, I can still go there. I can still see it. I can still use it and take advantage of those facilities and having quite a few here with the good, to Brian's point, the, the incredibly good latency that we have to those big peering points. Um, we talk about uh, Ashburn, you know, or established very early on because of the old May East and May West philosophies of, of the internet. Uh, and then Chicago, where we have these incredibly large, what, what we would call Toco Meet Me buildings where, hey, if, if I'm there and everybody else is there, then I have, you know, guaranteed low latency from one network to another as I transit from point A to point B. Well, thanks, Chris. Any other, uh, I have one final question, but if anyone else wants to hop in with something before we wrap up in about 10 minutes, uh, now would be a great time. All right, so Chris, I'll, I'll end with a kind of couple quick ones, and we do this across a bunch of our the programming that Ohio X does, uh, and a couple of folks, uh, Jason and, and Bob, that have been on like podcasts and other things, and Navid, I guess too. Uh, th so three folks that have done podcasts with me, but um, uh, the first one is, and you, you touched on a bit of this uh, in your talk, but um, I guess a little more pointedly, uh, you know, we're talking on January 6, twenty twenty one years, certainly last year, brought a lot of stuff we didn't expect. But as you're looking forward and what we kind of call future casting, if you will, what's something that you're really looking forward to see of how your work uh, will evolve or maybe something coming down the pike over the next year or two uh, that maybe you're, you're, that will stand out to you and that you, you're watching? Yeah, uh, for me, I, I mentioned I'm, I'd like to label myself as a network person and, and say that as versus someone that's dedicated with security. Uh, but what I'm looking for is, is the melding of that. So I mentioned like, you know, we used to have dedicated routers and dedicated switches. We had these discrete pieces of equipment. Uh, and now we've been able to put those together because the, the resources are so vast inside of one box. I can ask it to do more than one role. 
so what I'm watching for is what we're going to do with security in that same vein, where we have these dedicated firewalls that are separate from routers and switches. But could we take some of that functionality, those features that it, like a firewall appliance does, and can that actually be put inside of the networking device so that I have you know less OPEX, less CAPEX, and I'm able to instantiate things like not only routing policy and moving packets, but also preventing the packets that shouldn't be allowed to go. And so putting security policy in there as well. So to me, with the, with the speeds of the 400 gig and the 800 gig, what do we do to get those firewall type features into a natively network appliance? Awesome, well, thank you. And then uh, final one that is definitely more fun in nature, but uh, what is your favorite place in Ohio? Oh, hands down, Brewdog. Okay, <laughs> which, which one? Well, Columbia. Yeah, the one in uh, Canal Winchester. Okay, the, okay. Uh, and, the, and that's like the big one, right? It is. That was their what they would call their U.S. headquarters okay. yeah, in Canal Winchester. It's a great facility, a uh, lot of room. We've done events there, so you know mm -hmm. when we open back up and we can do events, they've got this uh, museum space that they'll they'll run out for uh, for events for you. So it's a great venue for that. Family atmosphere, uh, you know kids, adults, dogs are welcome. Uh, and of course the fresh beer. So we go all the way. There you go. Actually, we, we had slated it for the, the next ONUG meeting this year. So it be, you know, be on the lookout for that when we can get back to having physical events, it will be at BrewDog. <laughs> so, and I was so looking forward to staying over too, because I hear that they, you know, they have a hotel in the back and they have beer taps in the hotel room. So I, I was bummed to not, not to be able to experience that, but hopefully soon. Maybe a, a, an ONUG leadership retreat or something. So yes, right, there well. you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, with that, uh, we, we will wrap up for our hour together. Chris, thank you so much for sharing the work that you and the whole team are doing. Uh, thank you to everyone else for joining and uh, questions and comments. Uh, but this has been fantastic and really appreciate everyone taking time out of their Wednesday afternoon to join us. But again, Chris, thank you to you and the team and Bob and others that helped make this possible. And I, and I hope uh, folks enjoyed it. And as I mentioned, we have these monthly on a whole host and range of topics. So uh, next month could be on marketing and for technology. The month after that, it could be on sales. And so we, we do these to kind of bring together all sorts of ideas. But uh, so cool to see people from Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, elsewhere, even Michigan. Um, but it's a, uh, it's been a real pleasure and honor. So Chris, thank you so much and really appreciate everyone for joining today. Thanks, Chris. Keep up the good work. All right. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thanks all. Bye-bye.